Christopher Nolan's three-hour epic, Oppenheimer has managed to turn what would normally just be cinema-lover Oscar bait into a huge summer blockbuster. The world will remember this day. But how much of the film is actually true, and what did that ending really mean? Based on the book American Prometheus, The Triumph and Tragedy of J. Robert Oppenheimer, the film follows the life of theoretical physicist J. Robert Oppenheimer as his ego and quest for recognition of his brilliance leads him to becoming the father of the atomic bomb, and to the unfolding of unimaginable horrors to which there are no true end. Are we saying there's a chance that when we push that button, we destroy the world. Chances are near zero. Near zero. The film explores many key events over the course of his life and work, showing us multiple sides to the story, with the objective, fact-driven scenes in black and white and the subjective scenes from Oppenheimer's point of view in color. The film does not seek to make him a martyr, but instead give us a deeper insight into how someone so ingenious could be driven to bring such horrors into the world, letting go of all morals to achieve the success they think they deserve. You can convince anyone of anything, even yourself. Here's our take on what Oppenheimer got right, where it embellished, and how, in the end, all of the brilliance in the world means nothing if it's at the expense of everything else. They won't fear it until they understand it. And they won't understand it until they've used it. The film ends by finally revealing the truth of the conversation we've seen but not heard several times previously in the film. Oppenheimer and Einstein buy the pond at Princeton in 1947. The first time we see this event play out near the beginning of the film, it's from Strauss's point of view, too far away to understand what's going on. And this confusion, in fact, becomes one of Strauss's big reasons for wanting vengeance, because he believes that Oppenheimer is telling Einstein something negative about him. Now, as we come back to this scene for the final time, however, we get the true content of their chat, at least from Oppenheimer's perspective. Einstein pointedly telling Oppenheimer that, just like him, his moment of greatness is passing and he will have to deal with the consequences of his achievement. Throughout the film, Oppenheimer is shown to be willing to push his morals to the side in his quest for greatness, thinking that he would always be kept safe by his brilliance. We've got one hope. All America's industrial might and scientific innovation connected here. But as we've been shown in the security clearance hearing that is intercut throughout the film, his great mind alone is not enough to stop the windfall of consequences crushing down on him. You are the man who gave them the power to destroy themselves. Einstein tells Oppenheimer that after those in power feel that he has suffered enough, they'll pull him back into the fold, but only for their own gain. We see flash forwards of an elderly Oppenheimer being given the Enrico Fermi Award by President Johnson in 1963. Many of his once rivals are indeed there, cheering him on. Even Edward Teller, Nobody knows what you believe. Do you? Who had spoken against Oppenheimer at the security clearance hearing, comes up and shakes his hand. The entire ceremony is just the government using Oppenheimer for its own political rehabilitation, just as Einstein predicted. As Einstein begins to walk away from the pond, Oppenheimer brings up when he had come to him years before, worried that the atomic bomb might destroy the entire world. Well, we had a moment where it looked like the chain reaction from an atomic device might never stop it. Einstein asks, what of it? Oppenheimer answers, I believe we did. And we're served a series of images from the consequences of his actions that we all now have to contend with. The ever-looming threat of modern-day nuclear missiles. The final moments highlight the true core of the film, the unimaginable horror of what unrestrained ego and quest for glory above all else can beget. The final shots are of Oppenheimer, internally consumed, staring at the rain droplets on the pond. Director Christopher Nolan grew up under the specter of the Cold War and the fear that the entire world would be annihilated at any moment. So it makes sense that he would have an interest in exploring the nucleus at the center of this awfulness. The man who certainly didn't act alone to create these horrors, but was instrumental in their creation. He told Vulture, The delayed onset of consequences that people often forget. The film is full of different representations of that. Some visceral, some more narrative. Is anyone ever? going to tell the truth about what's happening here. But he also wanted to make sure he captured Oppenheimer's humanity, not just making him into a cartoon villain, but really grappling with the reality that in addition to all of that ego, he was also seemingly racked with guilt for what he had created and what he knew it would lead to once it became clear that the atomic bomb was not the end of all wars on Earth. 
Our work here will ensure a peace mankind has never seen. Nolan said, I felt that in the telling, I wanted to be true to my interpretation of the interior turmoil he must have felt, how that would have manifested itself. Oppenheimer's visions, which once contained the sparks of particle science, the excitement of future possibilities, and the suggestion of greater ideas to come. Oppenheimer sees things in sort of different dimensions. By the end of the film are replaced with constant reverberations of the destruction that he has wrought. All through humanity, we've been blinded by ambition and pursuit, and then the ramifications of something else. If you're enjoying our coverage of recent blockbusters, please check out this video's sponsor, Factor. Now that summer's in full swing, you may be looking for better ways to support your sunny, active days with wholesome, convenient meals. If you're too busy to think about mealtime, Factor has you covered with flavorful and nutritious ready-to-eat meal kits that are delivered straight to your door. Their menu is constantly changing, providing tons of options from calorie conscious to vegetarian. Save time and money by avoiding expensive grocery hauls, prepping, cooking, and cleanup. These fresh, never-frozen meals are ready in just two minutes, so you can simply heat and eat. This week, I chowed down on dishes like barbecue pork sloppy joes with chipotle sweet potato mash and roasted green beans. But my favorite was the tomato chicken basil risotto and parmesan broccoli. Round out your delicious meal with add-ons like plant-based smoothies. Head to factormeals.com slash thetake50 and use the code thetake50 to get 50% off your first box. That's the take 50 at factormeals.com slash thetake50 to get 50% off your first box. Now I am become death, destroyer of worlds. While over time this quote has become attributed to Oppenheimer himself in the West, as the film notes, it's actually from the Bhagavad Gita. I remembered the line from the Hindu scripture, the Bhagavad Gita. Now I am become death, the destroyer of worlds. Poisoning Patrick Blackett. Like in the movie, while Oppenheimer was attending Cambridge University, his tutor Patrick Blackett did push him to do lab work, which he hated. He eventually attempted to kill Blackett as revenge, though he ultimately failed and university officials found out. They wanted to expel Oppenheimer and press charges, but his father was able to convince them to only put him on probation and to force him to get psychiatric help. Oppenheimer and Einstein Einstein is used as a kind of mirror to Oppenheimer in the film, a star whose influence is fading as Oppenheimer's grows brighter. The pair did know each other in real life, having worked together for a time and becoming closer friends later in life. But Oppenheimer didn't actually seek out Einstein for his thoughts on Edward Teller's concerns that nuclear weapons could ignite the atmosphere. He actually went to Nobel Prize-winning physicist Arthur Compton. Secretary of War Henry Stimson saves Kyoto. In the film, Stimson removes Kyoto from the list of possible bombing sites because of the city's cultural significance, and because he and his wife had their honeymoon there. In real life, they likely didn't honeymoon there, and he wasn't able to just remove targets from the list on a whim. But this addition to the film does help elucidate just how flippant many in power seem to be with the reality of the destruction they unleash on the world. They were dealing with the very small possibility that when they push that button, they would set fire to the atmosphere of the Earth and destroy the entire planet. And yet, they pushed that button. Oppenheimer's womanizing. At first, it might feel like Oppenheimer's womanizing is Nolan's attempt to make up for his usual wife problem by giving Oppenheimer not only his own wife who lives to the end of the movie, but also several other people's wives too. But Oppenheimer really did stay married to Kitty until his death and apparently was quite the ladies' man. In his biography on Oppenheimer, A Life Inside the Center, Raymond Monk notes, he was very good looking and could be charming. It's clear from the memoirs of his secretaries that they were all in love with him. He did have several loves, including psychiatrist Dr. Jean Tatlock, played by Florence Pugh in the film. Dr. Jean Tatlock, more than just a mistress. The film focuses on Tatlock's romantic connection with Oppenheimer, but she had a very full, if tragically short, life. Jean Tatlock was blunt, knew what she wants, but at no point is she ever punished for that. She studied psychology and became a doctor in 1943, at a time when it was quite rare for women to study medicine, and worked at a hospital treating children. She did unfortunately pass away in 1944, though as hinted at in the film, there are some questions about if she really took her own life. In a blink-and-you'll-miss-it shot of her drowning, we see a pair of gloved hands holding her head underwater. 
While her real-life death was ruled a suicide, some in her life believed that the same government officials who had followed and wiretapped her also had her killed. Bohr's escape and the Germans' lagging atomic program. Bohr did in fact make quite a harrowing escape from Nazi Germany to England through Sweden. In the film, we hear him telling part of the story. During the escape, he had to fly in a bomber that went to such high altitudes that writers needed to wear oxygen masks to be able to breathe. But Bohr didn't hear the pilot when he told everyone to switch on their oxygen masks, so eventually passed out. In the film, Bohr also arrives with the news that, even though they had started out ahead, they have a 12-month head start. The Nazis had now fallen behind the Allies in the atomic race. And this is true as well. A miscalculation had led to the Germans running out of the graphite monitor for the plutonium option. And they went through several inefficient methods in an attempt to use uranium for the bomb that all failed. So was Oppenheimer a communist? Oppenheimer was allegedly not very political early in his life, but during the 30s, he began to support social reforms and other activist efforts. Tatlock, who openly supported communist causes, opened his mind to backing more left-wing endeavors. But Oppenheimer never joined the Communist Party or openly identified as a communist in any capacity, and was in fact notably willing to put his morals aside when he felt it would benefit him to do so. However, as the Cold War began and anti-communism soared, more militant members of the government, like Senator McCarthy, found it politically useful to brand anyone that wasn't fully pro-war as a communist. Oppenheimer's own opponents then were able to use his prior leanings as a way to strip him of any power. Oppenheimer vs. Strauss Oppenheimer's mostly one-sided feud with Strauss, played by Robert Downey Jr., is a very important part of the story. Truman needs to know what's next. What's next? We eventually find out that Oppenheimer's perceived slights against Strauss were what led Strauss to engineer the secret court to strip Oppenheimer's security clearance in the first place. You felt your judgment was sound on who on the team could be trusted. Oppenheimer's mocking of Strauss during the hearing on shipping isotopes to Europe is shown repeatedly, with Oppenheimer joking that the isotopes aren't something to worry about because they're less important than electronic devices, but more important than a sandwich. He did actually make a joke in real life, though it was that the isotopes were less important than, say, vitamins. And like in the film, Strauss's personal vindictiveness was indeed called out in his presidential cabinet nomination hearing. Though while physicist David Hill did say that scientists would prefer for Strauss to be out of government, it was actually chairman of the Federation of American Scientists, David Inglis, who specifically called out Strauss's vindictive attack on Oppenheimer. The bombs and their true toll. Oppenheimer, in the film, estimates that around 20,000 people will die in the bomb blast. And this seems to be accurate to his real-life estimation that he shared with Compton. But, of course, the real toll ended up being far greater, with real-world estimates falling between 110,000 and 210,000 people killed. And those numbers don't include the thousands of others who were severely injured in the blast and by the radiation poisoning afterwards. The film, in its tight focus on Oppenheimer himself, conceptualizes the horrors to a degree, but mostly in their effect on his psyche. But there are other films that deal directly with these grave events and their aftermath, importantly from the point of view of the victims, like Barefoot Gen, which is based on creator Kenji Nakazawa's own childhood as a six-year-old living in Hiroshima when the bomb was dropped, or Grave of the Fireflies, the tragic war film animated by Studio Ghibli. For a three-hour blockbuster, Oppenheimer has a very tight focus. This so-called modern-day Prometheus bringing fire to the world and being tormented for eternity. We imagine a future, and our imaginings horrify us. The concentration on this singular thread allows the film to dig into the deeper truth of how ego can drive people to do the unthinkable and devolve into shadows of their ideal selves. She feels so compelled to watch what's happening with these people and how they're drawn into the biggest of moral dilemmas and what they're wrestling with. It holds up a mirror to those in our present society that, like Oppenheimer, always seem to have some justification for why the evil they've brought upon the world is necessary. I don't know if we can be trusted with such a weapon, but we have no choice. Literature and film have long focused on explorations of polarizing and complicated people, not as a means to exonerate them, but for the rest of us to understand their psyches more deeply so that we may not become them. To give us the power to recognize the cowardice of ego and avoid its dangers. By not making Oppenheimer a one-dimensional villain, but also not letting him off the hook or glorifying him, the film asks us to see him as a person, 
I wrote the script in the first person. It made it clear to anyone who read the script that we're on this ride with Oppenheimer. And in recognizing his deeply flawed humanity, we see reflected our own capacity for great inhumanity, to overlook the suffering we may cause in the quest for glory or power. That's the take. Click here to watch the video we think you'll love, or here to check out a whole playlist of awesome content. Don't forget to subscribe and turn on notifications.